I'm grateful you're watching and listening to this message. I hope that through what you hear, you really grow to understand what God says and how much he has shown his love for you in Jesus. As God's word is open, I pray that he speaks to you. And listen, if it would be helpful for you to talk to someone, please reach out. We'd love to have a conversation with you. Again, thank you for watching. If you have your Bibles, could you open them to Exodus 40? Uh, as you're turning there, just I do want to, Paul's already given you an invitation to Good Friday, but I, I do want you to know we will be observing the Lord's Supper, and I feel like it's such a good week to do that. We'll also be hearing from, really reading through, straight through the scriptural account of Jesus and the crucifixion and the uh, uh, upper room. So I just want to, midday, noon, Good Friday, I'd love to see you, love for you to be a part of the Brainerd family there and join us for communion. Micah, if you could come read, uh, he's going to begin reading actually in verse 34 of Exodus 40. All right, as we finish up our series in Exodus, let's read Exodus 40, starting in verse 34. It says, The cloud covered the tent of meeting, and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. Moses was unable to enter the tent of meeting because the cloud rested on it, and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. The Israelites set out whenever the cloud was taken up from the tabernacle throughout all the stages of their journey. If the cloud was not taken up, they did not set out until the day it was taken up. For the cloud of the Lord was over the tabernacle by day, and there was a fire inside the cloud by night, visible to the entire house of Israel throughout all the stages of their journey. Keep your Bibles open, if you will, to the book of Exodus. Uh, between grade school, between doing undergrad, between seminary, went to lots of school and had lots of teachers, lots of professors. And I was thinking about that. Some of them I don't, I don't remember too much. And um, that probably has more to say about me than it does about them. Although, um, in all reasonableness, like some were clunkers, and we realized that. But I had a lot of really good teachers, and some of them, like every time I prepare a message, I remember my preaching professor kind of in my ear, and feels like whenever I open some passage in the New Testament, I have New Testament professors that are like in my ear, theology professors, or Old Testament, particularly one of my favorite teachers I've ever had was an Old Testament professor, and I remember him specifically teaching through uh, good portions of the book of Exodus, and so those teachers make an impression on you. Things really, really stick. And this morning, what I'd like for us to do is have the book of Exodus, like the whole book. There's 40 chapters, I think over 1,200 verses. Uh, I'd love for the whole book to be our teacher today. I think what it could impress on us, how it says, what it says, could shape us in such a deep way. And so I, I want us to kind of as we wrap up Exodus to take a look, just kind of an overview of the book, and we'll land in some certain spots. If you've been with us, we've been in Exodus a, a while, and you know, at the very beginning we met, Exodus starts with a family, a very large family, a very large group of people, but a family. And we first met them, this family has a future that does not look good. This family has a present of nothing but slavery. I mean, they, they've lived in this for 400 years. As you open the book of Exodus, so if we go all the way back to Exodus 1, it, there also is a history of God working with this family, a history of God doing some things, God promising some things, over-the-top promises that God has given to this family. But those promises seem so well in the rearview mirror, it seems like they're never going to happen. That's how you come into the book of Exodus. Of course, the large group of people that we're talking about are the descendants of Jacob, the descendants of Israel, they're Israelites. And when we first meet them, they're enslaved by Pharaoh in Egypt, and they really have no hope of deliverance, or so they thought. By the end, so we're, we're here in Exodus 40, by the end of Exodus, you actually don't just have a family, you have a nation a nation that God has formed. And then that nation is ready to move forward. And you get into Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, and then on to Joshua. I mean, the story really, really begins to take off. And so what I want us to do as we, as we look in Exodus is get 
Exodus has, again, it's our teacher today, so it has some powerful images that I think will impress on us because actually we're not just going to look at a book that was written several thousand years ago. The same God is still at work in many of the same ways that can shape our lives today. And so let, let's let Exodus impress on us a couple things, all right? If Exodus like puts anything in your memory to when you like open your Bible or you see Exodus, someone refers to Exodus. If it does anything for you, I hope it triggers in your mind a rescue. I would love for that to be one of your first thoughts when you think of the book of Exodus, a rescue that God has rescued us. It's interesting. There's this theme, especially at the beginning of Exodus, how God rescues through water. God does a lot of work through water, even the Nile River, which goes right through the the heart of Egypt. So the Nile, I mean, God rescued Moses right there at the beginning of Exodus, and he is rescued through water. He is sent down the river, and his life is spared. And actually, water plays this big, big role in Exodus because the, the biggest body of water that really comes to the forefront is the Red Sea. The Red Sea. If we have that picture in our mind, Red Sea, when we think Exodus, we think Red Sea, we think God has rescued us. Because at the Red Sea, that's where God moved toward Israel in such a definitive way for their good. He rescued by judging enemies, by removing the oppressor. And I want you to see these words of rescue. So again, different places in Exodus, Exodus 12, I mean, we've been through all these, but I want them I want to really make sure they they land in our hearts and in our minds. Exodus 12, verse 41 says, At the end of 430 years, on that same day, all the Lord's military divisions went out from the land of Egypt. Talking about Passover, it was a night of vigil and honor of the Lord because he would bring them out of the land of Egypt. And this same night is in honor of the Lord, a night vigil for all the Israelites throughout their generations because God was doing something. God was breaking the rule over them that Pharaoh had and Egypt had. The people respond. So when God tells them it's time to leave Egypt, says in Exodus 14, 13, they they have left. Now they're like right at the Red Sea. They've got Pharaoh chasing them down. They've got the Red Sea in front of them. And it says, Moses says to the people, you don't have to be afraid. You can stand firm and see the Lord's salvation that he will accomplish for you today. For the Egyptians you see today, you will never see again. God's rescuing. You keep reading in that same chapter in Exodus 14, it says Moses stretched out his hand over the sea and the Lord, the Lord drove the sea back with a powerful east wind all that night and turned the sea into dry land. So the waters were divided and the Israelites went through the sea on dry ground with the waters like a wall to them on their right and their left. And once again, when God acts, when God initiates a rescue, our job, our role, our responsibility is we respond by faith. And so what do they do? They start walking on dry ground. They literally walk by faith. And then finally, it says in Exodus 14, 30, that day the Lord saved Israel from the power of the Egyptians. And Israel saw the Egyptians dead on the seashore. The rescue is just beginning because God is going to provide food when they have nothing to eat. God's going to provide water when they have nothing to drink. God is going to provide. They're done with Pharaoh. And now they have a master, God, whose yoke is easy and his burden is light. And he's going to take care of these people. God has rescued his people. God's taken the initiative and he's rescued his people. What you find in Exodus is not a story of the people rescuing themselves. One of the things I love to do, we lived near Philadelphia for a while, and one of my favorite places to go in Philadelphia was Independence Hall. And I loved it. I mean, there's something um, powerful about the story of the United States that happened literally in that room. And there's something about that, of people gathering together and writing a declaration of independence and writing a constitution. There's something powerful about that. But that's not the way it goes down in Exodus 40. Not the way it goes down in all of Exodus. It's not as if the people said, you know, we're tired of Egypt. Let's set ourselves free. Let's get out of here. Let's be done with Pharaoh. We've had enough. Let's write our own constitution. It's not that. It's God helping those who were hopeless. God delivering them with his strong arm. And the good news is that God is still rescuing people. 
like by still, I mean literally today, he's calling out and he's rescuing, he's delivering people from bondage. In this way, it's, it's something even greater than a Red Sea moment. I think of people, people like all of us who have rebelled against him. People like all of us who choose to walk in darkness. People like all of us who are headed on a path to death. Enslaved not just to an earthly master, but enslaved to sin and bondage and we can't free ourselves. People who are are dealing with the effects of sin and the disease spiritually of what sin causes. Our story is a rescue story through the work of Jesus on the cross. We're going to it's one of the reasons we're going to come together on Good Friday is remind ourselves that what Jesus did on that cross is he broke the power of sin and he is right now, like right now, bringing sinners from darkness to light, from death to life, from slavery to freedom, from being impure and unholy to being completely healed, completely restored. Is that true of you? And I so appreciated Paul's prayer because it did make me ask and make me think and even sit in silence of like, does that still mean something to me? Maybe it meant something to you as a kid. I mean, maybe you heard the story of Jesus dying for your sins on the cross and it really moved you as a kid or moved you as a teenager or moved you as a college student and it had this powerful effect at one point in time, but it's just like you've gotten cold and callous and dull to it all. Does it still make you want to sing of what the Lord has done for us? The king who, I and mean, we sang about a simple kingdom that all got, it's like totally reverse. In this kingdom, the Lord shows his power by his humility. Do we forget sometimes? This is what I feel like we're in danger of. Instead of this beautiful story of God rescuing us, we're, we're so tempted to tell a story of like, we're rescuing ourselves. Oh, God, I mean, he does his, his part, right? But like, it's really about us kind of pulling ourselves up, any sort of pain rising above it. And so easy for us, that is a, a narrative where we trade this story that's so good of God taking the initiative and rescuing us. And we trade that story for, it really is a fool's choice. We trade that story for like, oh, I, you know, I, I kind of have everything you see I've accomplished, I've done. If it weren't for me, it wouldn't be here. We trade, it's a crummy trade. One of the reasons I know it's crummy is when you go that route of saving yourself, you have to keep yourself saved. And you're on this endless treadmill to try to perform, to try to not mess up. And you know your heart, and I know my heart. Can I be on that treadmill and never make a mistake? Or somehow find some math to work it all off? What if I really hurt people? What if it really costs a lot? There's such a different story. We forget how deeply flawed we are, how deeply sinful we are. We forget how wide the gap is. We minimize God's holiness. We minimize our sinfulness. And we go, ah, it's, you know, I, I think I can achieve some things. We have such a better story. When you could not save yourself, God rescued you. And he still keeps you saved. Safe in his hand. I was listening at the garden party the other night. I was able to slip in and hear a few of the stories of the ladies that shared. And it was just such a beautiful, it, it was this. I mean, this is what it was telling of God rescuing how God found those who are wandering. And he tracked her down. He tracks them down. And God finds the perfectionist, self-righteous person who prides himself on never making a mistake. And God tracks her down. God tracks him down. This is God who rescues us. Every time you think of Exodus, I'd love for every time you think of Exodus to go, oh yeah, that's, that's where God rescues us. That's where we learn that God rescues us. We're reminded of the Red Sea. There's another really strong picture and something else that I want to impress us with in the book of Exodus. And that is that God reveals himself. We learn in Exodus, God reveals himself to us through covenants and commands. You can't read Exodus without getting that pretty loud and clear. God reveals himself. So that word reveal or revelation is important. Through covenant and commands. And here the picture isn't a Red Sea. The picture is two tablets, two stone tablets that God gives. It comes, it's the words of God given to Moses on Mount Sinai. 
for how God's people will live. But there's a lot more on those commandments. If you have a picture of like the Ten Commandments and two tablets of stone, and all you think of is, well, that's where thou shalt and thou shalt not, then you are, you're massively underselling what those, what those stones represent. Those two tablets of stone represent that God reveals himself, and God makes a covenant, and God gives commands. Humans didn't just figure it out. That's why in Exodus 3, God tells Moses exactly who he is. In Exodus 3, this is what you are to say to the Israelites. I am has sent you. I am who I am. God also said to Moses, say this to the Israelites, the Lord, the God of your ancestors, the God of Abraham, the God of Jacob, or Isaac, the God of Jacob has sent me to you. This is my name forever. This is how I am to be remembered in every generation. You see, this is not about us, like looking at the stars and figuring out from the cloud formation, oh, God must be like this. This is not that. This is God saying, I am who I am. I will be who I will be. I'm permanent. I'm unchanging. You're not going to manipulate and mold me into your image. I exist. I'm the self-existent one. And he reveals himself to us and he says, you tell the Israelites that. I'm also the God of your history of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. God reveals himself, but God also makes a covenant. You read a a little bit about that covenant in Exodus 19 where it says, You've seen what I did to the Egyptians and how I carried you on eagle's wings and brought you to myself. Now, if you will carefully listen to me and keep my covenant, you will be my own possession out of all the peoples. And although the whole earth is mine, you will be my kingdom of priests, my holy nation. Do you see how the story is now connecting with the covenant or God's holy people, God's treasured possession? He's saying, you belong to me and I belong to you. We are, we are united. God makes a covenant. And out of that covenant comes commands, comes instruction, comes the law. That's actually what Exodus 20 says. A lot of people think the, the 10 commands, the 10 words, the 10 commandments, that it begins with thou shalt and thou shalt not. Actually, the, the story begins this way. Exodus 20, then God spoke all these words. I'm the Lord your God. He reveals himself. I'm the one who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the place of slavery. And then the commands come, then the instruction comes. It's it's meaning for us to connect something. And I hope you always make this connection. I hope you make the connection that anytime God gives commands, they're always for our good. Anytime God gives us commands, they're out of a covenant heart of wanting to do us good. So he does. He, Exodus, we read about it a few weeks ago. He gets in our business. Like we want to say, There are parts of life I want to give over to the Lord, but not all of it. There's portions of it where I go like, I think I'll let God have, especially like Sunday morning, 11 o'clock, I'll let God have all of that he wants. But there's other things like I'm not so sure, but that's not, that's not the way God operates. This, this covenant, this commands means God is very interested in what we do with what we have, our money, our possessions. It gets, it actually gets pretty invasive. God's very interested in how you do friendships the people that are close to you, the people that surround your life. God's very interested in your motives and your, your drives. God is very interested in, in how you use your time. He spells out what your sex life is designed for. He spells out what family relationships are meant to look like, what parenting looks like. God has, he gets very invasive in your emotions and your feelings, what's going on on the inside when he says, you, you shall not covet. He is very interested in how we treat those that somehow find their way to the margins of society. He's very interested in what you do with those that are like immigrants and orphans and widows and all those that maybe society looks another way. Do you see this? Like God is ordering a life, but that life is so based on this covenant, he gives commands, but it's so based on the covenant and it will always be for our good. So you, you walk in the way that God wants. And it's not like in 10 years you'll go, I never should have done what God said. And now I have this life of regret because I did. You'll never think that. You'll never say, I wish I wouldn't have obeyed all of those commandments. I wish I would have done things my own way. The people here respond in Exodus. They respond in faith, which is always, again, the right response. When God tells you, when God when God gives the covenant to you, when he tells you how to live, the right response is always, yes, Lord. And that's what you find in Exodus 19, 8. The people respond together. We will do all that the Lord has spoken. 
That's what you find in Exodus 24, 7. The covenant scrolls are read aloud to the people and they respond, we will do and we will obey all that the Lord has commanded. That's the way we're meant to respond. And God gives us a covenant and gives us commands. You see, God is, God reveals himself and he reveals himself through covenant agreements, promises, and through commands, connects who he is with the relationship we have with him and how we're supposed to live in the new covenant. God's still doing this, right? God, in the new covenant, I, I read these words in 1 Corinthians 6, you were bought with a price. See, the new covenant is about Jesus shedding his blood for our sins. You were bought with a price, therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's, they're his. You see, you are his treasured possession. And because of that, he spells out how we're supposed to live. I'm not my own. Here's the way. Walk in it. Don't go to the right. Don't go to the left. It's the best way. It's for your good. I want to ask, is the covenant and the commands of God, are they still sweet to you? Do they still mean something to you? Or have you kind of gone like, nah, I'm, I feel like I'm now in the graduate class. I can leave all of that other stuff behind. And I'm kind of now graduated to independence and I can do life on my own. No, you can't. No, I can't either. The world pushes. It often tells us that what should orient our lives is not so much something outside of us. You see, everything here is outside of us, God revealing himself to us, God making a covenant with us, God giving us commands. I will say, like the world we live in pushes in a very different direction, and it will say, actually, what should matter the most to you is everything inside, what's coming on the inside, whatever hunch makes sense to you, you act on it. Whatever, whatever seems right to you in a given moment, whatever feels good to you in a given moment, that's what you're supposed to do. It's, it's not so much institutional religion as it's intuitional religion, as someone's described it. Like your intuition will always serve you. You just make yourself happy and follow, kind of follow your heart wherever it leads. But how different scripture is. Our scripture says we have to trust something outside of us. The word of God by the way, our world also will tell us, like, you don't belong to anyone but yourself. Our world will remind us pretty regularly, you don't belong to anyone or anything. And you, if, if you want to belong to something, you make that choice. But again, I don't see that as good news, because if I only belong to myself, then I only can trust myself. I never belong to anyone else. I've always got to hedge and protect my freedom, my autonomy. Like nobody can get in, but the good news of scripture, I think the two tablets are reminding us of something, a covenant that goes so, so deep. God made an everlasting covenant with you. You belong to him. He's taken on full responsibility of care for you. And it's an eternal covenant and he's given you his word. He's actually in the new covenant, says he writes on our hearts what he wants. He impresses it so deeply in us. There's something, there's something about knowing who God is because he's told us who he is. There's something about knowing I belong to God by his choice, not just because I signed up, but it was his choice to shower love and nothing can change that. Knowing because he's told me what he expects for me and it's always for my good. Do you see how Exodus can be a great teacher to us? It can, with the Red Sea, we can go, okay, I'm rescued. But then we move over to two tablets and we can say, God has revealed himself to us. As we think of Exodus and the Ten Commands, they can be a prompt, not just a, oh, are these all these rules I can't break? No, no, no. But God's spoken to me because I'm his. I'm his treasured possession, a holy people. There's one more scene that just seems to dominate the end of Exodus. There's one more picture that I want in your mind. Whenever you think of Exodus, I'd love for you to think of the Red Sea and the stone tablets. But I'd also, I also want you to recognize how Exodus will impress on us God coming close. God coming close and, and guiding us to the promised land, to where we ultimately belong. See, God stamps one more thing on our heart, uh, one more thing on our hearts that defines who the people of God are. And the picture we have at the end of Exodus is a picture of a tent. Actually, the tent of meeting dominates the end of Exodus. 
So I think I counted 13 chapters at the end of Exodus. That's a third of the book is consumed with this tent of meeting. You see, God comes close in this tent. The tent was designed, listen, the tent was designed to be at the middle of the camp so everybody could see it. And that the tent was designed to bring people to him, not drive them away. The tent was holy, but it also was inviting. And not only that, but the tent then moved. It, it guided people to where they were supposed to go. It's interesting in doing study, and we don't have time to get into all the connections here, but a lot of writers have seen a connection between creation in Genesis 1 and 2 and Exodus 40, where the tent is finished. There's some interesting connections, and I just want to leave you with a couple of them, because in, in Genesis 1 and 2, you read all these, all these references where God said, let there be light, and there was light, and then there was the end of the day, and then God said, and it was, and there was the second day, and God said, I mean, it's all these kind of pattern. Well, actually, what you find in Exodus 40 is the people build as the Lord has commanded. The people build this as the Lord has commanded. The people build this as the Lord has commanded. It's the same kind of rhythm. God said it, and they did it just as he said it. There's another neat connection, though. At the end of, at the end of building this tent, it says in Exodus 40 and verse 33, so Moses finished the work. And a lot of people have seen the echoes, too, to God finishes creation, and then he rests because it's done. And he rests because it's not only done, but it's very good. And you also see, like, when the temple, when, the, when this tent of meeting is done, what happens, it's almost as if God takes all the cloud from the mountain and puts it right over the tent and says, this is very good. My glory will fill this tent. My glory is present among the people. It's almost as if God's saying once again, this is very good because God is dwelling with his people. We find that the tent has a, it like goes mobile. So they pick it up and they move upon God's direction. That's what we read in a few different verses there, especially verse 36 and 37 and 38. They, when the cloud's taken up from the tabernacle, they, they move, but if the cloud was not taken up, they didn't set out until the end of the day it was when it was taken up. And like right there in the middle, it's a visible, almost like, a missionary presence too. It's not just the presence of worship, but they're signaling to the Canaanites and the Egyptians and the Amorites and the Amalekites, all of them. There's something different about these people. I think what I love most about the way, the way all of this unfolds in Exodus with this tent though is something that really, really stands out because it's interesting as you read through the book of Exodus, there's like seven chapters of the tent in Exodus 25 to 31, the tent is being designed, okay? The tent is being planned. And it's like intricate detail. And this is God's word. He could have filled that space with lots of different things, but it's like piece by piece by piece, painstaking detail. And so you have Exodus 25 to 31 telling us of this tent and exactly how it's supposed to be designed. And then at the very end of Exodus, you have what six chapters telling us how it was constructed, every, every piece of how it was built, just according to the plan. But if you'll notice, kind of something sits in the middle of that, right? Something sits in those three chapters in the middle, Exodus 32 to 34. What happens there? It seems like there's this amazing account of this tent going up, and we've got it being designed and being constructed, but then right in the middle. You know what happens in those chapters? It's the golden calf failure right in the middle of this tent that all the symbolism is so significant. The beauty of it is so remarkable. Right in the middle of that is this ugly thing where instead of the tent, instead of God drawing near, the people said, we want something else. We will have something else because we need something else. It's interesting in this perfect picture there is this ugly thing right in the middle. That ugly thing is met with massive, massive grace by God so that you have God's compassionate forgiveness overriding this failure. You have the God revealing himself as merciful and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love. 
showing faithful love to thousands of generations. So I wonder, for that generation that always looked at the tent, would they remember like it was planned and then it was constructed, but right in the middle? We messed up. This is, this is our life, people. <laughs> this is where we are. God shows amazing grace. God has a plan. He's directing our path. And sometimes right in the middle of all of that, we, we mess up so royally. And yet we experience God's compassionate forgiveness. The tent tells us that God comes close. God guides us. We don't, this side of the cross, we don't have a tent. We have something even greater, and that's the Holy Spirit who is drawn near, who is guiding us. That's why we don't trade. We don't take something, we don't take a trade where we think we can do better than God's guidance and try to map out our own path. Or when we do try to map out our own path, when we decide like, well, I know where I'm trying to go. I know where I'm trying to get my, my life. Like, I know what priorities matter to me. And when we kind of dictate those internally, it all blows up in our face. We're frustrated. And maybe we're willing to call God in to do some of the cleanup. But we kind of want to keep him at the, kind of the edges. But the tent reminds us, you don't keep him at the edges. He's like right at the center. What if in all of our efforts to like, try to run our own path, try to push him to the edges, push him to the margins, and say, no, I'm, I'm going to be in control of what I'm doing. Can I ask you a question? Like, What if the destination you have in mind for your life, apart from God, what if that's not for the best for you? What if it's messed up? What if it's like you're climbing a ladder, but it's attached to the wrong thing in the end, and you just never knew? What if you can't navigate the complexities of life on your own? What if you so push the Lord out that like, like your kind of last resort is prayer, not your first response? And what if life gets so hard and so complex? What if you hurt people? What if you destroy others? What if you can't work all things together for your good, despite your hardest attempt? What if life all of your efforts at it have a way of isolating you from the people that you care about? And what if God can't be manipulated? What if it's not as simple as like you just ringing a bell and when you need an A on a test or a promotion at work or a little bit more money in the account? What if it doesn't work like that at all? You see, the good news is something so much better is you, you were never designed to run your own show, call your own shots, determine your own destination, and get yourself there. That's not the way you're designed. You're designed for a creator who knows the path and a redeemer who can pull you out of the pit and bring you and put your feet right on the solid rock. So we don't have a tent. We have the spirit of Jesus who's present in us, the spirit of Jesus who assures us in our weakest moments. In the times we go, I don't even know what to pray about. The spirit goes to work helping us. We have the spirit of Jesus that is producing fruit in us. Fruit that we have no regret. Fruit that actually serves other people instead of just being all about ourselves and leaving us pretty hopeless at the end. We have the spirit of Jesus conforming us to Jesus himself. We have the spirit of Jesus walking us all the way home. Of all weeks, I think this is the week. I'm so glad we ended here. Like we, We've heard the gospel according to Exodus. Of all weeks, this is the week to hear it. Because I, I think about the rescue and I think, I think about the Red Sea and I'm reminded of all the people that on Palm Sunday, right? Palm Sunday, they're saying, save us, save us. We need a rescuer. We need a rescuer. And they didn't exactly know how that rescue was going to go down, but a rescuer had arrived in Jerusalem. This week, we can go to Exodus and we go, oh, I see that this week. But then I think, of the work on the cross that initiated a new covenant. I think of God once more revealing himself in a way that nobody would have thought of. Our king gets executed. Some traitor sells him out. Our savior takes nails in rescuing us. And that's what launches a new covenant, his agreement to us, sealed with blood, his blood, not ours. This is the way you're doing it. Of all weeks on Good Friday, we get to stop and remember God reveals himself once more through covenant. 
and gives us commands and says, this is the path, walk in it. And then next week, Lord willing, we meet in this room and we remember that he's not dead, but he's alive. And he's ascended to heaven and he didn't want to leave us comfortless. So Emmanuel has ascended to heaven, but he left us his spirit inside of us. And we can worship in spirit and in truth. We have our something so much better than the tent of meeting. We have the Holy Spirit. Yeah, of all weeks, this is the week to hear the gospel according to Exodus. I pray that anytime you hear this book, anytime it comes up, you'll remember the Red Sea, the tablets, and the tent, and let it point you to Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Thank you, Holy Father, for giving us your son. Thank you that we're not looking at a an old covenant, we're looking at a new covenant that is so eternal and so permanent. We'll never improve on what you've done for us. We cannot save ourselves. We can't direct our lives. We can't get ourselves to the promised land, whatever that is or means to us. But you have taken us by the hand and are ready to walk us all the way home. So we, we thank you, Lord. I pray now that you would teach us to teach us to rely on that. Teach us to humble ourselves and to abide and rest in who you are and what you've done. Thank you for the good news of Exodus. We ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen.